Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to session two of uh, our Sea Power Conference, and this is going to be a regional naval overview, uh, continuing the theme of our uh, shared collective cooperation. Uh, as we all know, the Indo-Pacific is important, and it's about scale. It comprises at least 38 countries and shares 44% of the world's surface and about 65% of the world's current population. It counts for 62% of, of global GDP and 46% of the world's merchandise trade. In this idiosyncratic maritime region, seven out of the top 10 largest navies in the world are Indo-Pacific navies. Six of the top 10 largest merchant fleets in the world are Indo-Pacific fleets, and of an estimated 4.6 million global fishing vessels, the Indo-Pacific is home to a fleet of 3.5 million vessels, or 75% of the worldwide fishing fleet. The busiest international sea lanes are in our region, as are nine of the tens, nine of the world's 10 busiest seaports. Additionally, the reliable estimate is that between 250 and 300 submarines uh, will soon be operating in the Indo-Pacific region. But in contrast to competition is cooperation. As mariners with expansive experience and extensive knowledge of our oceans, the sentiment that is a rising tide lifts all boats, is clearly apparent to us all. When it comes to the maritime commons, a commonality of purpose is what will enable prosperity and security for all. This session will present the views of the chiefs of the regional navies on how they contribute to the region's prosperity and security. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the naval chiefs and representatives from Canada, France, India, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And it's my great privilege to call on my friend, the commander of the Royal Canadian Navy, Vice Admiral Craig Baines, to offer his perspective. Thanks, Craig. Thanks very much, uh, Mike. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, I, I can't promise uh, that I'll be brief, but uh, I will be short. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can't help uh, with this crowd uh, to bring a little bit of Canada to you before I start and all of you might not be aware that uh, hockey playoffs are going on back in Canada right now and my beloved Toronto Maple Leafs are in this playoffs trying to win the Stanley Cup and I track this very closely because the last time they won the cup was the year I was born and uh, yes that's well over 50 years ago. And I'm concerned that the next time they win uh, the Stanley Cup might be the year that I die. And my wife says not to worry that I'm going to live forever. Um, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to provide a Canadian perspective on this important topic. Canada is an Atlantic nation. It is an Arctic nation but it is also a Pacific nation, although that's not necessarily what everyone thinks when they think of Canada. However, a number of factors have converged lately that have seen a major shift in Canada's connections to and reliance upon the Indo-Pacific region. Our, our people-to-people -people ties have deepened and will continue to do so. In fact, 48.1% of all immigrants to Canada were born in Asia as of 2016. As Canada continues to negotiate, imp implement free trade agreements throughout the region, our economic connections to the Indo-Pacific are deepening. 
Therefore, Canada recognizes that to be more integrated with and to prosper from a fast-changing and dynamic system, we must have a seat within the institutions responsible for regional governance. These institutions help to maintain the rules-based international order that in turn provide for continued stability and prosperity for the Indo-Pacific and its partners. Canada has also learned that to be truly accepted as a member of the Indo-Pacific community, we must make meaningful and sustained contributions to the region, particularly in security. This is why Canada has increased its presence and regularized its contributions to Indo-Pacific security and stability. For over 70 years, Canada has been part of the United Nations Command Korea to manage the armistice with North Korea. In recent years, we've increased our contributions to this effort, making Canada the second largest contributing country. Also related to the Korean Peninsula, Canada maintains its commitment to routinely deploy warships, maritime patrol aircraft, and personnel in support of the multinational effort of monitoring UN Security Council sanctions against North Korea. The Canadian Armed Forces has also increased its presence in the region through the establishment of more defense attache positions, including in Malaysia and Vietnam, with more to come in the future. But perhaps the most important aspect of Canada's contribution to regional peace and security is the Royal Canadian Navy's routine deployments of warships into the Asia Pacific. During these deployments, we conduct forward naval presence operations across the region by undertaking joint exercises, transits, and port visits with friends and partners. Most, re most recently, HMCS Winnipeg participated in the multi-aircraft carrier exercise in the Philippine Sea led by HMS Queen Elizabeth with 17 ships from six countries. Winnipeg also transited through the South China Sea in a task force of 16 ships from the UK, US, Netherlands, Japan, and New Zealand. Moreover, Winnipeg transited the Taiwan Strait alongside the USS Dewey in accordance with international law. These types of deployments are vital given that security and stability have deteriorated in critical maritime zones of the Indo-Pacific. This is especially true in the Taiwan Strait and the East and South China Seas, where there has been significant increase in military activity related to sovereignty, sovereign rights, and contested territorial claims. Specifically, China's continued militarization of disputed islands in the South China Sea, as well as use of maritime militia and coast guard vessels in aggressive activities that are below the threshold for conflict, continue to undermine regional security. As we have seen in the Ukraine, incremental disregard for international law and the rules-based international order can lead to severe and sometimes unexpected consequences. Therefore, the security challenges that we see in the Indo-Pacific have implications far beyond regional stability and are of the utmost importance to all those who benefit from open and free societies. Canada's naval deployments and participation in maritime multilateral activities with like-minded partners are more than symbolic demonstrations of military partnerships. They are object lessons in the determination of countries that value the rules-based international order to defend a system that benefits us all. We must stand firm together to protect the rules-based order from aggression and coercion that seeks to undermine our governments, economies, and societies. To further mitigate these challenges and to maximize the significant opportunities that the Indo-Pacific offers, the Prime Minister of Canada has called on our Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of National Defense to develop a comprehensive Indo-Pacific strategy. This strategy aims to deepen diplomatic, economic and defense partnerships throughout the region, including through regular and predictable deployments of Royal Canadian Navy assets to the region. Canada is also undertaking the largest recapitalization of its fleet since the Second World War. We understand that strategic competition among states will continue to rise and that a robust, globally deployable Navy will be one of the key enablers to manage this challenge alongside our partners. This includes the development of the Canadian surface combatant based on the Type 26 design, the acquisition of joint support ships to support international deployments, as well as the refit and eventual replacement of our Victoria-class submarines. With these capabilities, the Royal Canadian Navy will stand ready to project credible sea power in the 21st century 
when called upon by our government as part of a coordinated effort to advance our interests and defend our values across the Indo-Pacific. Through more focused, consistent, and dependable Government of Canada activities in the region, we will continue to promote open and democratic societies, the rules-based international order, prosperity, stability, and peace as a Pacific country and a member of the Indo-Pacific community. The Canadian Navy has a bit of a slogan that goes along with our, our more classic ready I ready, and that's ready to help, ready to lead, ready to fight. And the ready to fight part is so that we don't have to. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Craig. It's now my pleasure to call upon our second speaker this afternoon, the commander of the French Armed Forces in French Polynesia, Rear Admiral Jean Mathieu Ray. Yaurana, as we say in Taishan. Um, I first want to thank you for your invitation and your welcome, sir. Uh, this is a great pleasure for me uh, to be here with you today, coming from Tahiti, where my HQ is. I would like uh, first to, to present you my function in this region. As a French sailor and also a regional joint commander, my role is to command the French forces operating in Asia Pacific from Malacca to America. I am at the head of a joint force composed of assets from the three services, temporarily reinforced from Europe or from our other overseas territories. My main mission is the protection of our sovereignty, of our territories, and of our fellow citizens against all threats. My naval chief of staff, who I am representing today, Admiral Vendier declared, all the things that are not secured are looted, polluted, and challenged. Our territories are in an area which is now the heart of the world. In 2018, France released its Indo-Pacific strategy. It is the acknowledgement that the area is now a strategic place. The expertise of France is also known in specific domains that are the core activity of our armed forces in the Indo-Pacific region. In this region, we are permanently based about 7,000 military personnel, 15 ships, 40 aircraft. Our areas of excellence are the Coast Guard function as well as HDR management. That is the main reason of Marra exercise conducting at that moment in Bora Bora Island under my command or during this week. It is the fifth phase uh, under my deputy command. In that spirit, we operated with our partners in Tonga in January. With our partners as a Pacific nation, we ensure the respect of international law and the freedom of navigation in common spaces to promote multilateralism. The French armed forces intervene all over the Indo-Pacific, from South America to African coasts, with permanent forces periodically reinforced from Europe. We did this last year with deployments from every component, nuclear submarine in uh, um, China and the Philippine Seas, Rafale fighters with tankers and airlift assets in Hawaii and Tahiti, and uh, army troops in a task group, amphibious task group 
called Jandark, conducting ARC-21 exercise in Japan. This surge was the biggest activity that we had for a long time in the Pacific. Recently, the French Navy frigate Vendémiaire operated in China and Philippine seas. Our ship also supported the ECC mission, just mentioned by my predecessor, Enforcement Coordination Cell of North Korea against nuclear proliferation. This summer, the French Air and Space Forces will conduct the Pegasus operation. They will also attend the pitch black exercise in Australia. Secondly, I would like to point out that France is the only foreign European country in the Indo-Pacific. The area is geographical, human, strategic, and economic reality due to its presence in both oceans with its five overseas territories, New Caledonia, French Polynesia, Wallis and Futuna in the Pacific, La Réunion and Mayotte in the Indian Ocean. Close to two million French citizens live there. The EEZ of all these territories makes France with more than nine million square kilometers, has the largest EEZ of the region. We foster the expansion of mutual knowledge and information sharing. It is the best way to ensure peace, especially when it comes to rules and limits. To my mind, and this is the French position as a balancing power, we have to discuss with all our partners, even with our competitors. In this spirit, I have fruitful discussions with my counterpart in PRC, General Wang, based in Canton. I could develop during Q&A if you want. In order to promote multilateralism and to develop cooperation with many nations in the region, I started in November 2021 a cycle of annual high-level workshops for the Coast Guard Network in the Pacific. The second session will occur next semester in New Caledonia. Concerning the maritime domain awareness, we are involved in the information fusion centers network, in Singapore especially, where one officer of my staff acts as a liaison officer. We are also engaged in HADR through mechanisms such as the FRANZ, France-Australia-New Zealand Agreement, or through multilateral exercises such as Southern Cross or Marara, I previously mentioned. We did one operation recently for Tonga after the disaster that hit this country. With the coordination of France, we sent humanitarian aid on board French Navy vessel and aircraft from New Caledonia and French Polynesia. France, as I mentioned earlier, is the only sovereign European power in the region, but we are also part of the EU. The release of the EU strategy for the Indo-Pacific on September the 15th of 2021 is a major step forward. In addition to the economic and environmental fields, the EU has also set ambitious objectives in terms of defense and maritime security. In particular, it reaches to ensure the enhancement of the naval deployment of member states, notably by extending the concept of coordinating maritime presence, CMP. This concept started from the Guinea Gulf in Africa and will be used in the Indian Ocean and soon in the Pacific. It contributes to reinforce the capacity of partners' countries, for example, through the Crimario Initiative, Critical Maritime Routes Indian Ocean, which is a maritime route awareness program that was recently extended from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific. In this context, France is ready to assume its role as a European country by taking advantage of its long experience in the region. In this mind, 
France took the presidency of the Council of the EU last January. We must collectively remain firm in our commitment for freedom at sea, continue dealing with climate changes, and reinforce the respect of international laws. Thank you again for the floor. It was an honor to express to you the views of France and the EU for maritime security and naval cooperation in the region. And thank you for all of us participating to our exercises or supporting our assets, ships, and aircraft during our deployments. Thank you again. Jean-Mathieu, thank you very much for that uh, great oversight of uh, what you do in our region. Uh, our next speaker this afternoon is the Flag Officer, Commanding-in-Chief, Eastern Naval Command of India, Vice Admiral Biswajit Dasgupta. Thank you, sir. Distinguished guests and speakers, Chief of the Australian Navy, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, let me thank uh, Admiral Noonan for his kind invitation and the opportunity to speak to you at this forum. I would like to first start by saying that the Indo-Pacific region is an idea and geographically it might have certain different interpretations for different people, but going by what Admiral Noonan said, the number of people that live here, the combined GDP of all the countries here, as well as the trade that flows through this particular region, it can aptly be termed as a super region. It is definitely comprising of countries and island territories which are present in two contiguous oceans, that is the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, and therefore, it is decidedly maritime in its orientation and maritime in its character. Many countries who do not have a physical presence in this region, but are also very, very interested because their economic destiny and future lies here because of the trade and commerce that flows to and fro to their countries and from their countries. It provides India with two distinct advantages. One is that the name brings a certain focus on India as a country. And secondly, the maritime character of this region lends a certain focus to the Indian Navy. Many other countries are interested in the region because interference of good order or interference of trade might impact them at some point in time. Let me also try to plug in this region with the Look India and Act India, uh, sorry, the Look East and Act East policy of India. Most of this region, barring the Arabian Sea and a part of the North Indian Ocean, lies to the east of India. India's Look East and Act East policy, therefore, plugs in very well into the Indo-Pacific. Such a large grouping, however, has a few downsides. It is likely that with so many countries being part of this very large region, internal groupings or smaller groupings within countries of the Indo-Pacific may have the potential for polarization. Therefore, the inclusivity versus exclusivity debate may come in once in a while. Cooperation amongst countries of this region would depend on shared values, shared interests, historical perspectives of each nation, 
and these are sometimes vastly different. Therefore, cooperation and collaboration within this region would have to be based on issue-based convergences. It is possible that everyone, all countries, may not agree with each other on all issues. Much has been said about rules-based international order. The effectiveness of such an order depends upon the obedience of rules. And in case rules are not obeyed, there must be mechanisms to apply pressure to what is the common understanding of international good order and discipline at sea. Most cooperative mechanisms that we have today remain short of the conflict threshold. And therefore, whatever we do at sea in terms of cooperative engagement, especially from the Indian perspective, falls always below the military threshold. Recent conflicts have shown that countries will have to fight their own battles largely without outside help. Recent conflicts have also shown, have also proved that several assumptions that we have taken for granted have been proven wrong. The aftermath of the current conflict, which is ongoing, has put several other nations dependent on others in trouble. In such a situation, the importance of geography becomes all the more important. Close neighbors versus distant neighbors is something that countries will have to think about. The advantages that accrue from a close friendly neighbor vis-a-vis -a, -vis a distant friendly neighbor will have to be evaluated. Self-reliance has been underscored. From the perspective of India, it is a national policy that we will aim to be self-reliant in the future and reduce our dependence on external sources for defense manufacturing. General principles of Indian engagement with our friendly foreign countries has been the neighborhood first, and thereafter we move outwards into engagements which are beyond our primary areas of interest. This is mostly something to do with our own capability and capacity. India has never started a war. India has never been expansionist or aggressive in its outlook. India has been at the victim end of colonization and thereafter always responded appropriately to any kind of external interference. Peace is our culture, but we have learned our lessons. Capability development is important for us, and it is not just for our own armed forces and our own Navy, but it's also development of capability of our immediate neighbors and our smaller neighbors around us. We would like to safeguard our maritime interests in our primary areas and influence events beyond our primary areas of interest. At the same time, we would like to have the capability to raise the cost of intervention by remaining credible, combat ready, and future proofing to the extent possible. We would like to build capacity of our smaller neighbors so that they can help themselves. We would like to maintain stability in the ocean spaces around us so that economies can grow. 
India also, as a government policy, is not in the business of military alliances. But we do build interoperability with friendly navies, even in high-end military operations, as an insurance against an uncertain future. The aim is to have available a bouquet of options that will primarily promote peace, stability, and constructive engagement, but will also cater to contingencies when national interests are threatened. To my mind, few enablers of cooperative engagement and building commonality of purpose are information exchange, sustenance through logistics support arrangements, building of mutual trust through various means, interactions and exercises with several countries of the region that we already have, capability building and technology collaborations that support our indigenous manufacture of defense equipment. In the final analysis, what we will definitely do as cooperative engagement in the region is, certainly will cooperate for benign roles, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, always for diplomatic purposes, constabulary if need be, and military, we hope not. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bisbajek, for that great uh, insight into the role that uh, the Indian Navy plays in our very vast region. Uh, the next presenter uh, that will speak to us is my very good friend, the Chief of Staff of the Japan Maritime Self-Defence Force, Admiral Ryo Sakai. Hello, everyone, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Admiral Sakai, Chief of Staff, Japan Maritime Salute Defense Force, taking office just one month ago, newcomer. It is an honor and a privilege to attend the Indo-Pacific Sea Power Conference, and I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Vice Admiral Noonan who hosting this prestigious event and giving me this opportunity. On this trip, I brought my wife, and it is her first visit to Sydney in 34 years. The last time she came here was for our honeymoon. <laughs> when we arrived here yesterday, she said, a lot of things have changed in Sydney. And then looked at me, said, you also have changed a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. A lot of gray hairs, pecs, wrinkles on my face, but I was prudent enough to refrain from saying back to her, <laughs> so have you, you know? <laughs> Silence is gold. <laughs> anyway, Mike, thanks for giving us this opportunity to visit Sydney again. The city of Sydney reminds us of the early days of our happy life. Thank you. So before I speak, to, speak on the session theme, sea power in the 21st century, let me touch on the situation in Ukraine first. Russian aggression against Ukraine is clearly an infringement of Ukraine's sovereignty and territory, which is equivalent to a violation of international law. It also seriously violates the United Nations Charter. At the same time as the aggression, we confirmed that Russian naval ships 
including several submarines passed in waters in the vicinity of Hokkaido in the northern part of Japan. Russia also fired missiles in the Sea of Japan, repeating threatening activities to oppose sanctions imposed on it. Despite these actions, the JMSDF is enhancing surveillance activities against Russia, and the Japan's policy remains to cooperate with the international community to respond to Russia's activities in a resolute manner. At the same time, China is conducting its unilateral attempt to, to change the status quo by force in the East and South China Seas. North Korea is developing nuclear weapons and missiles and repeatedly launching missiles, which is against the UN Security Council resolutions. All their activities shake the foundation of the international order. To uphold the order, the international community needs to cooperate with each other to take firm measures. Having said the security situations around Japan, I would like to move to the session theme. In such severe security environments, I mentioned, we need to cooperate with our allies and like-minded countries to maintain a rule-based maritime order and ensure peace and security in the region. We navies have played a military role and police roles as well as a diplomatic one by using naval power. Our military role has included response to amphibious invasions conducted by other countries, protection of coastal areas, and surveillance of major straits and surrounding waters. Since the turn of the 21st century, however, threats have diversified from terrorism to piracy and illegal fishing. Our role has expanded into wider areas, including response to gray zone situations, which we cannot clearly define as peacetime or contingency. Development in science and technology has forced us to operate widely in cyber and electromagnetic dom domains, as well as the cognitive one, and engage in information warfare using various methods. War fighting in an environment which encompasses conventional and new domains is dominant so that we navies must have aware of any changes in the current situation and flexibly carry out diversified missions. Under such circumstances, in order to maintain a rule-based order in a vast ocean and ensure peace and security in the region, cooperation among allied and like-minded countries is indispensable. The entire international community must work together to discourage unilateral attempt to change the status quo by force and prevent conflict from occurring. It is sea power, including information capabilities, that plays a major part, and I do believe Navy to Navy cooperation will be more important than ever. Japan is in the process of, sorry? Japan is in the process of revising its strategic document to adapt itself to a new security environment. To fulfill its role, the James S. Dave is placing importance of cooperation and is considering increasing the effectiveness of defense power. Regarding cooperation, it is important as a domestic aspect to reinforce our joint operational capability and cooperate with other ministries and agencies. In response to gray zone situations, it is critically significant for the JMSDF to closely operate with Japan Coast Guard, and we are both further strengthening cooperation with each other. Internationally, we are aiming to reinforce the bilateral response capability with our ally, the US, and enhance activities through cooperation with like-minded countries. Affected by COVID-19, we still do not have so many opportunities 
for high level in person engagement and neighbor units reciprocal visits, including SIP support calls. Although defense exchanges with other countries are still difficult, navies can work together at sea in contactless manner. Even under that severe COVID-19 situation, the JMSDF is making the maximum use of the unique advantage to deploy its unit to many regions, create more opportunities for exercises and exchanges with our allied and like-minded countries, improve each other's tactical skills, and promote cooperation and friendly relations with them. All such efforts contribute toward peace and stability in this region. Last year, European navies such as the Royal Navy, the German Navy, the French Navy, and Netherland Navy were deployed to the Indo-Pacific region. We took the opportunity to have bilateral exercises with each Navy and multilateral, multilateral exercises with these countries, plus the US Navy, the Royal Australian Navy, the Indian Navy, and the Republic of Korean Navy. In addition, in the Pacific Islands region, the JMSDF had bilateral exercises with Palau and with Vanuatu for the first time. The JMSDF is also cooperating with other countries to maintain the international order. We have engaged in counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden and information gathering activities in the Middle East. Furthermore, we started the IMED, or Indo-Pacific and the Middle East deployment last year, focusing on the Middle Eastern region and contributing towards ensuring the safety of the sea lanes of communication stretching from Japan to the Middle East. During the IMED, the JMSDF made the port calls to Brunei, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bahrain, Malaysia, and Cambodia, and had a bilateral exercise with each Navy. All our activities were conducted throughout the last year by a total number of 114 ships, 159 aircraft, and more than 10,000 personnel from the JMSDF. And we conducted bilateral and multilateral exercises with a total of 22 countries, as well as 183 ships and 35 aircraft from foreign countries. Such activities serve as a foundation to realize the vision of free and open in the Pacific and the JMSDF is continuing to work with our navies, other navies in the coming years. To realize the vision of free and open in the Pacific, the JMSDF will promote cooperation with our ally, the US Navy. In addition, we place importance on and will further strengthen security cooperation with Japan's special strategic partner, the Royal Australian Navy. The Japanese and Australian navies cooperate not only on the occasion of military exercises, but also in actual missions such as surveillance activities to respond to North Korea's ship-to-ship -ship transfers in East China Sea, and disaster relief activities in response to the underwater volcanic eruption near Tonga in January this year. In addition, on the occasion of the bilateral exercise, Japan Australia Trident last November, a JMSDF ship protected a Royal Ocean Navy ship in accordance with recently amended Japanese domestic law. It was the first time for us to protect foreign assets other than those of the US and an epoch making moment when the application first made it possible for the Japan Civil Defense Force to protect Australian assets. In January this year, a reciprocal access agreement, or RAA, was finally signed by the Japanese and Australian Prime Minister at the summit meeting after years of effort by both governments. The signing was brought Japan Australian security cooperation into a new stage, and it will be an example for Japan in seeking to deepen relations with European countries such as the UK and France 
whose operational areas include the Indo-Pacific waters. Finally, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the foundation of the JMSDF. We are determined to further strengthen cooperation with other countries, such as the US, Australia, and other Indo-Pacific countries, as well as European countries. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Rio. And uh, I've always seen you as a very wise man. And uh, I think today we all know why. I had the pleasure to meet Kiko-san last night. Uh, and I, too, will not comment uh, on, on age or wrinkles or grey hair. Uh, it's great advice for all of uh, all the men in the audience here tonight. Uh, it's now my pleasure to, uh, to welcome to the stage uh, a good friend of Australia. He's well known to many of us here, uh, clearly uh, the chief of Navy staff of uh, the Royal New Zealand Navy, uh, my brother, Rear Admiral David Proctor. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I open by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Gargal clan, and extend a warm kia ora from Iwiheramana, my people, uh, to the past elders, present elders, and those who are emerging. Colleagues, just like for your nations, the international rules-based uh, system is fundamental to New Zealand's national security. The system as it is today, which is really multiple interconnected systems, is a result of development and evolution since World War II in ways that draw strongly on liberal democratic values and deliberately placed multilateral approaches at the centre. This is an international system that strongly aligns with New Zealand's values and interests. This system has afforded New Zealand the protection and support of multilateral architectures, institutions and collective arrangements and supported New Zealand's broad access to global markets for years. The system has disciplined states exercise of national power through a complex arrangement of international law, rules, custom, convention, and norms of behaviour. The system's respect for sovereign equality of states and supported stability and provided safeguards, albeit imperfect, against coercion, confrontation, and conflict. Intensifying strategic competition in, in the Indo-Pacific, layering on top of existing regional tensions and fault lines, is increasing the potential for confrontation. There is no doubt. Even without strategic intent, the growing numbers and operational proximity of military assets from competing states, coupled with an increasingly conservative actions and robust responses, raise the risks of tactical miscalculation. Growing strategic competition will challenge the formal institution of the international rules-based system, traditionally charged with peace and security issues such as the United States Security Council. We are seeing that alive now. States may increasingly act to prosecute their interests unilaterally, in small coalitions, or in bespoke grouping, groupings in ways that will be at various degrees of alignment with prevailing international norms. Some aspects of the system will continue to be of central importance, particularly in relation to dealing with issues on which the world's major players at least broadly agree and climate change is very likely to be one of these issues. Climate change impacts will increase and intensify security concerns, and these impacts will become more pronounced as time goes on. They will include extreme weather, environmental impacts, social impacts, and security implications. These climate change impacts are accelerating and increasingly affecting human security. Through increasing temperatures, we are seeing changes in weather patterns which have a direct impact on food and water resources. Climate change impacts will increasingly intersect with national security, particularly in the Pacific. In some cases, the direct impacts of climate change will, will be sufficiently serious in scope and or scale to threaten the overt security or viability of countries. The 2018 Boy Declaration by the leaders of Pacific Islands Forum countries and territories, including New Zealand, reaffirmed the climate change presents, quote, the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific, unquote. This coupled with growing strategic competition, conflicting visions of regional and global orders, 
and changes in the balance between democratic and authoritarian systems of government, pressure will increase on the alignment of the international rules-based system and its underlying liberal democratic principles. Over coming years, elements of the system may function in ways that are less supportive of New Zealand's values and interests. These tensions will probably be most acutely felt in new and emerging issues, such as in relation to the development of international norms governing state behaviour in space, and certainly cyberspace. The wider Indo-Pacific is a key region for New Zealand's broader interests, and faces both chronic and acute security challenges. New Zealand Defence Force and Navy activities and engagement in this theatre can generate a broad, ra broad range of benefits. Preferring, preparing for and conducting operations in the Indo-Pacific, particularly in higher threat environments and alongside New Zealand's key security partners, also helps to maintain Navy's ability to conduct high-end military operations in other contexts. Defence can and should maintain the ability to make materially valuable and internationally credible contributions to addressing Indo-Pacific security challenges, and particularly in Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia, in line with New Zealand's interests and values. Where possible, such contributions will normally take place within a multilateral framework and or in concert with our key security partners. New Zealand's immediate region, its neighbourhood, encompasses an expansive, diverse and largely maritime area within the broader Indo-Pacific, spanning from Antarctica through the South Pacific to the equator, from Pitcairn to Southeast Asia. Royal New Zealand Navy activities form an important aspect of New Zealand's support for the security, stability and resilience of individual Pacific Island countries and the region as a whole. This includes contributing to building Pacific countries' resilience against and supporting responses to natural disasters and incidents of instability, and working with Pacific countries to develop shared approaches to regional security issues. Looking south, the Antarctic Treaty System contributes to stability on the Antarctic continent and in the Southern Ocean. The New Zealand Defence Force provides critical logistics support to New Zealand and partner science-based activities there. HMNZ Aotearoa, our new tanker completed her first Antarctic resupply mission only three months ago. She'll be a regular feature from the deep south to the equator, right across the Pacific into the future. The RNZN is well suited to operating in the Pacific. We are geographically close, we are a trusted partner, and we're a familiar face in the region. While acknowledging the question of balance and resource careful use of resources. Prioritising the Pacific will not preclude New Zealand from contributing further afield in a targeted way, especially in the wider Indo-Pacific. The Royal New Zealand Navy will be present, and increasingly so, as our combat ships emerge from their upgrade programme. We're a blue water navy with a reputation for contributing to global security and prosperity. This will not change. Into the future, in addition to familiar activities such as disaster response, New Zealand Navy activities will include expanded maritime domain awareness, including patrols alongside our partners, greater interoperability with partners through the Indo-Pacific, Northeast Asia, South China Sea, our vessels will be there. Operations to ensure New Zealand and our partner systems are defended against increasing cyber threats and a greater, more persistent support for our Pacific partners, including expanded combined training, will be features of our activity. Prior to this conference, I attended the Southwest Pacific Heads of Maritime Forces meeting. Mike kindly hosted that. This forum, which began in Auckland in 2017, aims to increase cooperation, trust and confidence between the heads of member navies and maritime law enforcement agencies in the Pacific. It enables the discussion of maritime security issues of mutual interest. I was heartened by the commitment shown by the meeting's principals to work better together, to use their skills and competencies to best effect as kaitiaki, or maritime stewards, guardians of the Pacific. This is an example of like-minded cooperative behaviour, and as a group we are certainly demonstrating commonality of purpose. It's good to see you colleagues, it has been too long. Mike, thank you very, very much for this opportunity for us to commit to commonality of purpose. Kia ora.
Uh, Dave, thanks very much, and thanks very much particularly for uh, the, the focus on the Southwest Pacific and uh, uh, the importance of climate change and how it affects our immediate region. Uh, our next speaker this afternoon uh, is Commodore Philip Poliwara. He's the uh, Deputy Chief of the Papua New Guinea Defence Force. Philip, welcome. Firstly, uh, thank you, uh, Chief of Navy, Australia. Sea power in the 21st century, Indo-Pacific Naval Overview. Please, see this from the eyes of a small Navy. Chief of Navy, Royal Australia, Vice Admiral Michael Noonan, Chief of Navies, Chief of Fleets and Commands, Delegation Heads, Defence Attaches representing your countries here, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon all. I acknowledge and respect the traditional landowners of this land in the past, the present and future. I am indeed honored to represent Papua New Guinea Defense Force to deliver this short address before this esteemed conference and audience. Sea Power 2022, Sydney, Australia. In 2017, I delivered a, on behalf of the Papua New Guinea Defense Force, a short address titled New Value from the Ocean, Development and Health, Ocean Health. The short address discussed Papua New Guinea's blue economy, which is currently a work in progress. The ocean's contribution in our individual nation's wealth is very important as a setting for global trade and commerce, as a significant source of food, energy, and mineral wealth. This century, it is likely to become an economic force as the green economy or the land economy declines. The drivers are many and varied, but have their origins in our growing familiarity with the ocean environment. New technologies that make it feasible and economically viable to tap ocean resources. Long-term growth and demographic trends fueling the search for food security and alternative sources of minerals and energy, seaborne trade and rapid coastal urbanization, among others. The protection of our blue economies is a challenge and will still be a challenge going into the future. These challenges call for greater cooperation among affected countries in the surveillance and protection of our blue resources. This is where Papua New Guinea believes sea power finds its place. Military maritime power or sea power a former NATO Supreme Commander, Allied Commander Atlantic Admiral Edney, described the utility of sea power as providing, I quote, the most acceptable form of military presence and response in crisis situations. They convey calculated ambiguity and calibrated response. Their presence on the high seas does not irrevocably require a given course of action, but the chronic are varied and the message clear, unquote. Maritime power in the broadest sense is the military, political and economic power exerted through an ability to use the sea. The sea is a unifying factor for military operations. Maritime power has traditionally been employed to control the sea communications for the general economic well, well-being, welfare or survival of sea dependent states. Military maritime power, generally referred to as sea power, has also had a long-standing ability to influence events on land through power projection and amphibious operations, ship launched operations. A unique feature of sea power is the ability to integrate land and air power within its capabilities and exploit the land and air environments. Navies have often depicted it as a trinity of functions. These are usually described as diplomatic, constabulary, and military in nature. These functions arise out of the inherent and unique vassality of maritime forces. While naval vessels are major weapon systems in their own right, they are highly adaptable in combat roles, while also providing the opportunity for calibrated response in other situations. They are uniquely controllable owing to their command and control system and ease of coordination, which also allows for devolved command 
and the execution of machines as opposed to task orders. By themselves or in a task group, warships can perform missions that are social, humanitarian, political, or military in character. They are flexible in response so that ships, while complemented and equipped for hostilities, can respond rapidly to contingencies by making a quick transition from peacetime activities to military role and vice versa. Warships are adaptable in roles. All major warships have offensive and defensive capabilities. They can therefore operate, it, operate in a variety of environments and when formed into task groups, maximize their capabilities of individual platforms, thereby allowing a task group to operate in a higher degree of a threat than individual units might, or they may signal higher levels of a threat than individual units might, or they may signal higher levels of commitment in a conflict before it descends into combat. An important point to grasp, therefore, is that navies are unique in their employment. That is, their full employment is across the spectrum, from humanitarian intervention to peacetime diplomacy. Disaster relief, search and rescue, evacuations, crisis response to military operations. Admittedly, the other elements of a defense force can perform some of these functions, but they cannot perform all of them. They are likely, unlikely to be able to do without considerable external sustainment and support, and they often cannot do so without first having to stamp a footprint or boot on the ground. Sea power and people security. It is important to bear in mind that the policing and diplomatic roles of our navies and those that are among are more probable going to occur. This is for a number of fairly evident reasons, including the important and desirable one that peaceful means should be used to dispute settlement, thereby relegating the use of force to the last resort or not at all. Maritime forces continue to expand in numbers and capability in many parts of the world, notably in the Indo-Pacific area. In many respects, this reflects the growing maritime responsibilities arising from the law of the sea and humanitarian law, while caution needs to be exercised in assessing the implications of these developments. They remain significant as the potential for strategic competition has not diminished. The Southwest Pacific Heads of Maritime Forces meeting yesterday discussed many of the benefits and contributions of military power, military maritime power for the general economic welfare and survival of sea dependent states in the Indo-Pacific region. The geographical expense of the blue continents, I'm saying continents in the past continent, or the Pacific and Indian Oceans demands the need for sea power for the economic welfare and survival of small island states. The experiences of Kiribati and Tonga and the struggles of Fiji, New Zealand and Australia and other navies in the Indo-Pacific who came to assist them are telling realities of the importance of sea power in the Indo-Pacific region for people-centric security as opposed to state-centric security. Changes in threat dynamics and the emergence of non-conventional threats worldwide are progressively with the scaling down of the Cold War. Security threats are taking a paradigm shift from state-centric rivalry to people-centric induced threats. <clears throat> Military maritime security and the PMSP. Our EEZs cover millions of square kilometers of ocean space. Some of the biggest EEZs are found in the Indo-Pacific area and it holds the largest tuna stock in the world, and as such, surveillance and policing are a major challenge. Our vast EEJs require assurance of adequate financial resources and technology to provide effective surveillance and monitoring. It also requires effective interagency and international cooperation so that surveillance resources are pooled and coordinated. The PMSP program, or Pacific Maritime Security Program, headed by Australia, will provide some relief in surveillance and policing efforts, but it requires a collective effort from all of us to protect our blue economy. The economic contribution of the ocean <clears throat> is significant 
to the national economy of small island countries in the Indo-Pacific region, <clears throat> but remains undervalued. The nexus between sea power and economic development cannot be overlooked. Finally, we will always remain connected by the oceans in one way or another. Therefore, it is in our common interest to protect our global common. Measuring our ocean economies or wealth generated using the sea gives us a first order understanding of the economic importance of the seas and the contribution of sea power to our prosperity. The nexus between sea power and economic development is inseparable. A question that Papua New Guinea continues to ask is, how can defense add value to the nation, to our region, and to our world? To you, how can you add value to your nation, to your region, and to our world? Thank you. Uh, Philip, thanks very much for that excellent presentation. We all know that navies are indeed unique, but you provided us a very clear understanding of the linkage between sea power and human security. Our next speaker uh, is a great friend of Australia, and uh, he is none other than Rear Admiral Aaron Beng, the Chief of the Republic of Singapore Navy. Aaron, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I would first like to put on record my thanks to Admiral Noonan, the Australian Navy and the organisers of this event and the invitation to speak uh, with you today at this conference. It is an, indeed an honour for me to share this stage with so many esteemed colleagues from partner navies across the region. But more importantly, I think this speaks volumes of our collective commitment to dialogue for regional peace and stability. It is also testament to Admiral Noonan's and the Australian Navy's ability to bring navies, leaders and peoples together. Preparing for this speech, when I looked at the order of proceedings, I realised it's a rather tall order for me to come after six other distinguished speakers and preceding the first sea lord and uh, the commander of the US uh, Pacific Fleet. But I will try. And I got no jokes about my wife, yeah, who's out, happily out shopping now. <laughs> Let me first start with uh, echoing affirmation of some of the key points that have been made by colleagues so far. First, the fact that the Indo-Pacific uh, or Pacific region, our Asia-Pacific, is a maritime region, uh, and it has a maritime. It is a central focus of where the global uh, order and global economy is going to shift to. Secondly, the criticality of the rules-based order as a foundation of regional peace and stability. But third, that the existence of the rules-based order is necessary but insufficient for peace and stability, that we also require practical, tangible cooperation to encourage adherence and also to discourage disobedience. Singapore's support for these points stems from our realities. Also a very small nation, one that is improbable, with few natural resources. But we, thank, uh, we are very thankful for one natural factor that has been in our favour which is our geographical position, astride economic sea lanes. And we have been able to benefit from this because of a period of regional stability and adherence to a rules-based order founded on the 1982 UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. We think this has kept our sea lines of communication open and free-flowing, and trade free-flowing, which was a key to fueling this region's growth and the prosperity that we see today. We also recognise a broad-based desire within the region to cooperate for peace and stability. And this has often been spearheaded by navies. We have seen many useful spin-offs of operational frameworks that has contributed to the good order at sea that a lot of the speakers have spoken about. These range from mini-lateral arrangements, such as the Malacca Straits patrols, which had notable success in reducing piracy, and also more recently, the trilateral cooperative arrangement, which has reduced kidnapping incidents in the Sulu Celebis Sea to almost zero. And also multilateral arrangements, such as WPNS and ADMM Plus, which has advanced interoperability and built much needed regional capacity in areas such as maritime security, counterterrorism, and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. But our past successes are no guarantee for the future. 
Many of the speakers here have pointed to trends and developments that could undermine both the rules-based order that has been established as well as good order at sea. And a lot has been said so far about state and sovereign threats. Let me uh, cast the focus on the issue in a slightly different light. I would like to point out for our recognition that navies and maritime agencies will also have to face a broader basket of threats at sea. Our collective challenges have grown to include the influx of illegal immigrants, human trafficking, human trafficking criminal activities, the resurgence of piracy, uh, possibly stemming from the economic fallout from the pandemic. What we constantly worry about is an inevitable nexus between these activities, which are more criminal in nature, as well as more high-end threats. For example, trafficking and piracy at sea can also evolve into pathways for terrorist infiltration and financing. Unregulated fishing militias can be politicised to stake claims in maritime disputes. Some speakers have also spoken about climate change that will bring new issues to the fore, such as degradation of coastal maritime ecosystems and uh, effects on economic livelihoods. With these headwinds, I have no clear solution, but I thought there are two questions that we need to collectively consider. First, do we cooperate more or less? I know there'll be people here wondering why we are even asking this question because speakers all say that more cooperation is better. But frankly, there will be forces pressuring countries to turn inward and perhaps step away from cooperation. For navies, it is simple to construct the argument that the threats have gone up and hence we have to build bigger and more capable fleets to defend our national interests and we can't rely on cooperation. Or, there could be divergent national interests or even competition between neighbouring states and then we decide that maybe we should go it alone and cooperate less. But I disagree with this view because it is only sensible and reasonable that we significantly enhance and reinvigorate regional cooperation. The key reason to this is that the range of a number of threats will undoubtedly continue to grow beyond the capability of any navy or maritime force to address alone, and to decisively tackle the full spectrum of threats, including future ones that we may not yet be able to see, we will need to rely on mechanisms of effective cooperation across our borders and maritime boundaries, more so than even before. I would like to give one example of this. Uh, there was a vessel some years ago, it was called the STS-50. It was a stateless vessel wanted by Interpol and had notoriously evaded attempts to capture it in many different countries for, for activities such as illegal fishing, fish slavery and identity fraud. The Regional Maritime Information Fusion Centre, Madagascar, first tracked and observed her to be heading towards Southeast Asia. This was in 21-8. And the French ILO shared her position with the IFC in Singapore. Our IFC then started monitoring her movement daily and when she exited high seas and started to near Indonesian waters, the Indonesian ILO at the IFC queued the Indonesian Navy that successfully led to her capture in Indonesian waters. This one case alone, think about it, would it have been possible for it to have happened without cooperation if we kept to our own stovepipes because the information and the ability to act resided in different places? Second question, who are our partners? The work of securing our shared maritime commons cannot be merely that of the navies alone. One step, and we can see this at this conference, is to step up cooperation with maritime and law enforcement agencies because threats going forward will continue to manifest and operate across the span of our jurisdictions. And our ability to respond and deal with this, these threats is no longer about how fast we can move actionable intelligence across navies and borders, but we must also do so with the right agencies that have the right jurisdictions and the right experience and knowledge to act in a coherent and seamless manner. But even if navies, coast guards and law enforcement agencies all stepped out of cooperation, I worry that this might still be inadequate. The next big bound for us to consider is whether we can consider a more broad-based framework of cooperation with navies, maritime agencies, but also with the maritime industry. And here I give another example from the RSN experience. This involves the hijack of a vessel called the Haisun 12. 
It carried uh, 20 over crew members and had about 3 million worth of oil and cargo at the time. When she was first reported missing in Indonesia, uh, we tried to track her. Her automatic ident system was off and the crew was not contactable by email because you know this is what pirates would do when they board a ship. All known sources of tracking were unavailable. But we were lucky in the IFC to have good links with our shipping partners and we learned that industry practice is that if there's valuable cargo on board, there's usually a secondary tracker for that cargo. We contacted the cargo owners who then uh, agreed to release to us the location of the secondary tracker. Again, this allowed us to identify her location and we queued our good friends from the Indonesian Navy through the Indonesian ILO and completed the safe recovery of the vessel and the crew. This would not have been possible if we had not had firm and trusted linkages with industry. This front, the broader-based practical cooperation between navies, coast guards and maritime law enforcement and industry has been one that Singapore has been committed to and trying to push on. And in Singapore, we've stepped up a series of coordination meetings and exercises with industry, and we're finding that this has borne fruit. Final point is that if you agree on the points above and the, pot the potential dividends, um, I put to you that the value from doing this comes not only against peacetime and civilian threats, because as many of the speakers have, spoke, have said, if we recognise the risks of threats going forward is not just in conventional conflict, but also in the grey zone or below the threshold of war, then actually the expanded scope of cooperation and capacity building across all these different groups of entities will give us the necessary capacity and capability to act going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Aaron. I know that uh, we all feel the pressure of the uh, competing priorities that we face daily, but you made it very clear to us all that we need to prioritise these and international cooperation between friends and partners comes at the forefront of this. Uh, it's now my pleasure and uh, great honour to welcome Admiral Sam Paparo, the commander of the Pacific Fleet. Sam, welcome. Uh, thanks to Admiral Noonan and uh, thanks to Australia for putting on this magnificent uh, conference, this exchange of ideas among us all. It's a tremendous honour to address all the partners here in the room. And more than that, it's a great joy as, we, as we're beginning to emerge from the global pandemic to be in one another's company and to reconnect uh, with each other, this community of practice, this uh, gathering of eagles uh, together. Uh, who, uh, who, who together help to uphold the international rules-based order. My name is Admiral Samuel Paparo. I've been the U.S. Pacific Fleet Commander for the last year. Uh, I represent my partner, uh, Lieutenant General Stephen Rudder, the commander of uh, Fleet Marine Force Pacific, and I represent my dear partner, Vice Admiral Mike McAllister, the U.S. Coast Guard Pacific Area Commander and the Maritime Forces of the Pacific of the United States uh, of America. And it's, it's, it is a delight to be with you today. Uh, you know, it, it is a particular disadvantage to go uh, towards the end, not as, not as great a disadvantage as the first Sea Lord has going last, uh, but uh, uh, having to follow and to integrate the ideas of so many august and learned leaders uh, but I'll do my level. I'll, I'll do my level best. As we talk about the international rules-based order, it sometimes presents as just a single phrase without understanding the true meaning of it. That begins with the inherent dignity of the human being, that then extends into accountable governments, and then the sovereignty that extends from an accountable government and the essential human dignity of human beings, and then the portfolio of international laws, of conventions, and of norms that support sovereignty and human dignity, uh, including the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the principles of freedom of navigation, recognizing that 70% of the earth is covered by water, recognizing that 90 plus percent of international commerce travels over the water, recognizing how the water sustains us, 
understanding that uh, inherently the salinity of the human being matches that of the ocean. It was John F. Kennedy who once said that, who I'm quoting there, who said that our salinity matches the ocean. It is from the seas that we came and it is back to the seas that we're called. And it's such an honor to be a part of this uh, maritime kinship among us all. And John F. Kennedy, by the way, the 35th president of the United States, whose life was heroically saved in the southwestern Pacific by the Solomon Islanders, and uh, whose who's, uh, Caroline Kennedy is soon to be the invested ambassador to Australia and uh, was previously the ambassador to Japan. All of this represents the fact that the United States of America, uh, like Canada, as, as so eloquently quoted uh, by Admiral Craig Baines, is a Pacific nation. And that for the United States of America, the security, the freedom, and the well-being of 338 million American citizens depends on, uh, on upholding the rules-based order. And in fact, those of all the world um, depend on that. Uh, Mike Noonan having quoted the very salient statistics of 50% uh, of the world's population, 60% of the world's economy, and seven of the 10 of the world's uh, greatest militaries existing here. And in fact, it is the international rules-based order and it is freedom of the seas and the concepts of sovereignty that have lifted 60% of the world's population out of poverty since the end of the Second World War and uh, lift 160,000 human beings out of poverty every single day. The key, the, the, the key theme, the remit of the speech today to discuss in the ways in which uh, each of our navies are contributing uh, to a free and open Indo-Pacific. I think all within earshot of my voice are aware of the scale and the geography of uh, the U.S. maritime forces uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the submarines that patrol its depths uh, to the ships that sail on, her, on the sea, uh, to the aircraft uh, that fly in the heavens and the satellites um, up above. And to talk about those capabilities is to deny uh, a fact that Commodore Palawara very saliently brought up in his discussion, and that is uh, the human beings. And uh, the discussion started with the inherent hu dignity of human beings. And in fact, it is our humanity that beyond our capabilities, it is our humanity and our partnerships that are our essential asymmetric advantage. Uh, this underscores a point that uh, Aaron very saliently made uh, when saying, should we cooperate more or less? And the answer is, undoubtedly yes on, on cooperation. I can discuss some of the more uh, salient exercises we've participated, most recently Balakatan. Uh, presently, as I utter these words, USS Pearl Harbor is exercising humanitarian and disaster relief in, opera, in exercise Marara under Jean-Mathieu Ray's a very able command. And uh, as I utter these words, throughout the South Pacific, uh, the hospital ship, United States Naval ship Mercy, is en route to the Southwest Pacific on, indeed, uh, a mission of mercy. Uh, all of us are uh, getting ourselves ready for rim of the Pacific uh, here come late, July, come late June, all through the month of July and early August. Uh, very excited. And then Kakadu uh, also here coming up in this fall is that... Uh, the theater is replete with exercises and cooperations. This conference, which Australia is so generously putting on, is uh, an exchange of ideas among the services, among industry. It's an exchange of ideas with industry booths to, to visit and to learn about capability. As sailors, we're always attracted uh, to technology. But uh, amidst all of that, uh, we also have to remember 
uh, as Aaron eloquently stated, and, uh, and as uh, Commodore Polawara eloquently stated, uh, our partnerships and our humanity. Those who would upend the international rules-based order abhor our partnerships. They abhor the values that we discussed, sovereignty, freedom of navigation, uh, the, 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 the rules of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And so uh, I hope we'll also take this opportunity during this time while visiting, uh, the, while visiting all of the displays and all of industry and exchanging ideas on those capabilities to refresh those partnerships. They are, in fact, uh, the asymmetric advantage that, uh, that this, this great community of practice uh, holds. The stakes, as we have seen here in recent months, have never been higher. Uh, uh, at risk is the very security, the freedom, and the well-being of all of those that wear this and look around. All of us people of the sea wear this. Um, represent. So uh, I thank you. I look forward to the questions, the exchange of ideas, and uh, I thank you all very kindly. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Admiral Paparo. Uh, you gave us great clarity as to our role as navies in upholding the international rules-based order but you also gave us clarity as to why it is so important. Uh, and I know that all of you in this audience would agree that our navies are all about people and our mission is all about people. Our final speaker today has uh, already been pre-announced uh, uh, by Admiral Paparo, but uh, by no means least is the Chief of Naval Staff of the Royal Navy and of course the First Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Ben Keys. And welcome. Those who are first shall be last. Um, actually, one of the delights of uh, knowing that I would be the last up, and I presume that's because I come from the country at longest range, was that the case for why the maritime is so important in this region would be clearly laid out. And so, luckily for you, I didn't write any paragraphs about that. But what I thought I would do is just mark why I am so grateful to Mike Noonan for giving me a chance to join this conference here uh, and represent a view from the United Kingdom and the Royal Navy. One of the things I've noticed in the last few years is I've had the privilege of traveling around the world and visiting a number of headquart naval headquarters, is I'm usually walked past a painting of a Royal Navy ship in the process of being sunk by the host nation. <laughs> One of the advantages of this conference taking place in an exhibition center is that I haven't found that painting yet. Um, this is a part of the world in which we have long experience. Captain Cook traveled through these waters just over 250 years ago, reaching Point Hicks, some 400 miles south of here, in 1770. And in so doing, he became what we believe in the United Kingdom, I gaze at my French colleague, the first documented European to visit this great island continent. And in making that phrase, I also honor the original custodians of this land, past, present, and emerging. And since then, these waters, this great ocean, is an area of the world we got to know well. The Royal Navy would visit frequently from Cook's time through to the 20th century, exploring from Antarctica to Japan, building partnerships with countries around the region, sharing knowledge, trade, and support wherever we could. And we are proud of much of our legacy. As many in the audience here will know, in March 1901, just six weeks after the death of Queen Victoria, the Commonwealth Naval Forces were established, and 10 years later, the Royal Navy's Australia Squadron became the Royal Australian Navy. But I speak with humility when I say we have history or a legacy, 
For in recent years, we have not been so present as a Navy. And today, we lack the contemporary maritime knowledge of this vast and vital region, a part of the world predicted to be the engine room of the global recovery from the pandemic. With so much maritime space here in the Indo-Pacific, the region enjoys a level of interconnectedness that offers the potential to unlock talent, resource, and growth. As all my panelists have discussed, we in the maritime are the beneficiaries of the global commons, the freedom of the high seas that offers so much to seafaring nations. And it's why I, as a sailor, was so delighted when the United Kingdom's integrated review last year highlighted the importance of the region and announced the United Kingdom's Indo-Pacific tilt. That, of course, immediately begged the question, what does that mean for us in the Royal Navy? Are we to flood the region with white ensigns again? In short, no. But we are determined to be present far more and to engage much more closely in support with you, for you, for whom this is home. We've learned from our past, our shared history, and we know that we are not the arbiters of taste. Far from it. So we will be here more, yes, but as partners. We've seen the shared success that cooperation brings, and I am determined that my, the service I have the privilege to lead will play our part with you, our allies, across the region. Of course, we're not starting from zero in all of this, but I do recognize we've got some journey to come, even if, as part of the government's ambition for a global Britain, we are to be confident and outward-looking, keen to operate, trade, and develop with all those around the world who would wish so with us. I'm delighted that this year marks 50 years of the Five Power Defence Agreement. And it was a great privilege and news for us last year that ASEAN granted the United Kingdom dialogue partner status. We have embassies or high commissions in all 10 ASEAN member states. And the total trade in goods and services between the UK and ASEAN at 36 billion pounds in the four quarters to the end of last year, almost all of which moves by sea. The Indo-Pacific is crucial to us, just as in the security cooperation under the Five Eyes Agreement, all of our other partners border the Pacific. And so last year, it was quite deliberate that the first operational deployment of the new aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth with her multinational strike group would reach from Portsmouth to Yokosuka, working with allies and partners through the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and in the Pacific. Throughout the deployment, we operated with, supported or visited over 40 nations, many of whom are represented here. At every turn, and often despite the constraints of COVID, we sought to renew and strengthen bonds of trust and friendship and demonstrate the strength of multinational co cooperation and collaboration between nations. We often found many who use the same equipment, the same tactics, who align with the same doctrine. This is the joy of navies. And through our network of defense attaches and defense advisors, we are building a network across the region. And as the carrier strike group returned back to Portsmouth, our two newest patrol vessels, HMS Tamar and Spey, through Panama, started the beginning of a persistent presence in the region that will last for years to come. Training and working with you, learning from you, and supporting you where we can. Tamar has exercised recently with the Royal Malaysian Navy, visited Singapore, and helped to enforce UN sanctions against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. While Spey, working under the guidance and leadership of Australian and New Zealand Navy cousins, has helped deliver aid to Tonga following the devastating tsunami, conducted easy patrols in the Solomon Islands, and helped Fiji in combating illegal, unregulated fishing. Bottom line is, this is all part of our mission in the Indo-Asia Pacific, to build understanding some of the challenges that face the area, working with nations here, and all of which is to safeguard natural resources, combat climate change, 
and contribute to maritime security. And in return, you are very generously sharing the local knowledge that we once enjoyed and that we hope you will continue to do so. Because as a fellow maritime nation, albeit one at range, we share your concerns. From illegal fishing to global warming to tackling international crime routes. And underpinning all of this, as we have discussed for many of us, sustaining the, the peace and stability which allows the rules-based system for which our economies has, have flourished on, which allows that to be sustained, even though it is currently being challenged in a number of ways around the world. As one of the leading maritime powers, the Royal Navy has an obligation to play a part in upholding this system, deterring those who would wish to see it undone, wherever in the world that may be, and being ready, as Dave Proctor so and Craig Baines have both uh, put across so clearly, been ready to confront it when those would wish us harm. I cannot pass without mentioning AUKUS. Clearly this is a tremendous new opportunity. I would say this as a nuclear submarine operating Navy head to see this fabulous capability introduced into this part of the world. And alongside American colleagues, we will do what we can to support the Royal Australian Navy at the start of what, as Jonathan Mead described this morning, uh, earlier this afternoon, will be an extremely demanding journey. But it's an ambition that I believe is a good one. And working in cooperation across the three nations and with an eye on sustained security, I am confident is one that can be realized. So in sum, I'm delighted to be here today because it means that Global Britain, as, as determined by our Prime Minister in the Integrated Review last year, is welcome back in the Indo-Pacific. We come with renewed vigor as a Navy and commitment to our friendships and partners as people. But we come with humility. We have much we can do to benefit each other, boosting prosperity, peace and security. But we also have much we can learn from you. Thank you. Uh, Sir Ben, thanks very much for your great uh, delivery, uh, not, which not only recognised our shared history uh, as mariners, but uh, your clear recommitment uh, into our region uh, with the Royal Navy and what you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end uh, of the formal presentations, and uh, I'd be uh, remiss if I did not point out the, the very stark realities of not just AUKUS, but uh, the formal and informal alliances that these gentlemen represent. Uh, I call out the, uh, the well-recognised Five Eyes partnership, uh, the Seven Eyes relationship that we, uh, we share here, uh, ANZUS, Oscan Zukas, for the communicators amongst you. Uh, clearly the Quad, uh, even though it's not a military uh, collective, we certainly uh, represent uh, a, an ability to deliver effects through the diplomatic quad, clearly the ANZAC Alliance and the regional partnerships that we enjoy, uh, as uh, David Proctor most clearly pointed out, through the South West Pacific Heads of Maritime Forces meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in thanking the nine great friends and partners of Australia on the stage this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to question time and uh, we'll follow the format of this morning's presentations uh, where we will use the electronic questionings that come coming up. Uh, the first one that has arrived is to Admiral Paparo. Uh, Admiral Paparo, how might hypersonic weapons affect the Indo-Pacific and the United States role in our region? Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question very much. Uh, I'll begin by hearkening back to a comment that General Campbell made, which is uh, the speed with which 21st century warfare is, appro is a approaching us. And uh, 
And so when General Campbell was talking about crude, non-crude, and advanced weaponry, he spoke of crude weaponry as those elements that are eternal and those non-crude and those advanced weapons as, as weapons that are new to us. And what we've seen in the commoditization of precision strike technology across the world is that we, we may no longer count on sanctuary as a function of range alone. And now, uh, victory is conferred on the fighting force who can see, decide, act, uh, effect, and assess faster than the other. And this is the value of hypersonic weapons. Whether hypersonic weapons are employed against opposing weapons batteries, whether they're employed against sensors, whether they're employed against control and reporting centers, uh, they confer the ability to see, decide, and act faster than, than an adversary can act. And accordingly, it is an absolutely critical investment for the future for warfare at sea, from the sea, from the sea to the land, from the land to the sea, uh, to be able to be relevant and effective and to be able to effectively deter and if deterrence fails, to respond to aggression. They are important uh, investments. I'll note that it is an important pillar in our AUKUS agreement uh, moving forward and it's a place for profound investment for the allies for and on behalf of all of the partners that are operating in concert for a free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you for that question. Thanks very much, Admiral Paparo. Our second question is directed to uh, Rear Admiral Ray. Uh, Jean-Michel, uh, Mathieu, how, how would France uh, like to develop her involvement in the Indo-Pacific and what part might Australia have to play in this engagement? Uh, thank you for, for this question. As I mentioned before, we, we have permanent uh, forces based in, in the area, in La, Re La Réunion, uh, New Caledonia, and uh, French Polynesia. And we are renewing our forces to, to try to maintain advantage against uh, adversary. Uh, so we, we uh, uh, develop new uh, patrol boats. We, we will be based uh, from uh, 2023 to 2025. Uh, in La Réunion and um, uh, New Caledonia and French Polynesia. And uh, in the same uh, aspect, with the same ideas, we are uh, renewing the um, surveillance aircraft based in these uh, um, territories, uh, once again, to, to be more, more efficient. And um, this, uh, this, uh, the part of this answer is around our uh, territories. It's our main concern, of course. Uh, to, to maintain our sovereignty on these uh, territories. But uh, in this huge area, we need partners, as I mentioned during our, uh, my, my presentation. And we, we need support, and we are ready to, to give support, if needed, in uh, logistic, intelligence, and operation. Logistic, of course, you understand uh, it's a question of port visit, refueling in your countries, and, and uh, support our crew. Uh, for training and, and so on. Intelligence, of course, information sharing, uh, starting in um, this, this aspect and in to, to, to high level. And in operation, it's to uh, conduct uh, operation together, as we did with, uh, with your country, as you, as you know, uh, uh, in uh, South China Sea uh, last year. So, uh, the, and, and we, we need to, to, to develop the, this kind of cooperation with all the, the partners uh, present in this room. Uh, thank you very much, Jean-Matthew. Uh, a great description of how we already work together and how we will continue to work together into the future. Uh, the next question uh, is uh, for the First Sea Lord. Uh, Admiral Key, what is the opportunity that you see in AUKUS? Um, thank you. 
for the question. I slightly disagree with the question. It's not singular opportunity, it's opportunities. And I, I think there are three that immediately come to mind. Uh, the first is uh, the recognition for that there are a number of areas, not just in uh, bringing nuclear submarines into the Australian Navy's orbit, uh, that we can share ideas to develop. Um, Admiral Sam next to me has mentioned hypersonics. It was also mentioned electronic warfare, quantum technologies, artificial, in artificial intelligence, all feature in the ambition of AUKUS, and some of which will now be able to accelerate their introduction into the sort of maritime capabilities. The second opportunity, it seems to me, is that with the Royal Australian Navy also bringing in nuclear submarine uh, capabilities, that we are creating a, or they are creating a significant contribution to security in the region uh, because of the capabilities that nuclear submarines offer. And I think that is a, it is a bold, ambitious, and very deliberate and welcome step. And thirdly, from a Royal Navy point of view, um, because of the infrastructure that will need to be developed by Australia in order to support uh, nuclear submarine operations, that gives us basing opportunities in this part of the world. And one of the issues for all navies operating at range is, you know, from whom and where can you find appropriate levels of support? And whilst all of the partners and friends that we have in the audience have at times through the last few years given, uh, given us in the Royal Navy you know, terrific uh, logistic enablement. There is something particularly demanding about uh, submarine nuclear infrastructure. And for that to be available in this quadrant of the world, south of the equator, uh, would be enormously helpful in the long run. Thanks very much, Sir Ben. Uh, you mentioned bold, ambitious. You didn't mention expensive, but uh, <laughs> that's a problem for uh, Jonathan Mead to work on over the next uh, 12 months or so. Our next question uh, is for Vice Admiral Dasgupta. Uh, the question is, following the P8 activities between Australia and India in the Northern Territory uh, recently, what other opportunities do you see for our nations to cooperate in the near future? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the first answer to this is that uh, there's going to be a reciprocal uh, deployment of uh, Australian P8s to India very soon in the future, and we take that forward. I also mentioned that uh, there are several enablers that uh, foster further cooperation. Uh, information exchange, we have already have uh, uh, agreements in place for information exchange, so that's already on with Australia. Uh, we have uh, a logistics support agreement also, which has been operationalized, so uh, we do have a logistics support agreement also with Australia. Uh, interactions and exercises uh, uh, happen every year, and uh, India and Australia uh, mutually participate in all uh, maritime exercises that are held uh, by the host countries. So that is also in place. Um, there are uh, several other uh, areas that uh, we could cooperate, but uh, I think... Uh, Cooperation in technology uh, would be uh, useful uh, for both uh, Australia and India. As far as uh, India goes, I did mention that uh, we are looking uh, hugely to develop uh, self-reliance and an indigenous capability for uh, all aspects of defense manufacturing. So I think um, through Navy-to-Navy -Navy cooperation, we could take the uh, technology cooperation also forward. But I think we are doing uh, adequately enough um, uh, with India and Australia at the present moment. Thank you very much. Biswajit, thank you very much for that great answer. And I just want to highlight to the audience uh, that in February this year, we were able to send HMAS Aranta to exercise Milan, uh, which uh, Vice Admiral Tasgupta, uh, I think, almost single-handedly pulled together as the first major uh, exercise that was hosted uh, in India uh, involving international participants. And it was certainly the first uh, exercise or first nation where Australian men and women were able to step ashore for the first time after two years of contactless port visits. So, Biswajit, thanks very much for that opportunity uh, to uh, expand the cooperation between our two navies 
not just in terms of operational uh, response, but in terms of human to human contact. And uh, as we've heard throughout this afternoon, it's all about relationships. Thank you, sir. Our next question uh, is to Commodore Poliwara. Uh, Philip, what is the impact of illegal fishing upon Papua New Guinea and how might Australia better serve to defend against this problem? Oh, thank you for the question. I now will pay for the lunch and the, I think, afternoon tea. <laughs> uh, it is better managed than uh, in the past. As we fix one problem, another one pops up. Now we have an issue of what we call the blue boats. These are the boats that carry drug, and we don't know where they come from, but they use what we call the island hope and we assume it's the market is Australia or US. And that is the challenge now we face, apart from it sometimes gets kinetic with these uh, blue boats. Mm. And also uh, weapon smuggling. These are the uh, two major issues now we uh, face, but the fishing is being managed well, not only the Navy, but we have a very, very effective uh, uh, national fishing authority from the national level down to the provincial level and also the uh, watching system throughout the country. Uh, how Australia can uh, uh, help uh, uh, assist uh, in this? We are going through a major restructure, which is, uh, I am the uh, positive consequence of that. Last time I was here as the chief of staff, now I'm the deputy. The structure that we have is the uh, Australian Army 8th Brigade left after the Second World War. So we are, after 46 years, 47 years, we are going through to restructure the force to reflect what we see coming in, the, in uh, what, what the future holds for us and for the region. So we will have the Navy itself as a Navy, Army, Air, and other support that's uh, demanded by the three service. Uh, that's the way we're heading, but the Australia's assistance, we are going through a, a very, very intensive uh, training program, not only for the Navy, the Navy, Army, and the Air Force, preparing for that restructure and the future that we hope uh, we are looking forward to. Uh, we are looking at a five year after five year, Australia will leave us and we will take over all these, uh, all these changes. Uh, as we speak, uh, uh, patrol board is being commissioned and LCHs uh, will be handed over this Friday and other things that will come. Others are in concept stage, uh, which I will not discuss with you. Maybe when you invite me, uh, Admiral, in the next sea power, I will discuss with you and say with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think I paid for my lunch. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Philip. I think you might invite me to your next Sea Power Conference uh, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, next question is for Vice Admiral Baines. Craig, Canada is an Atlantic nation, an Arctic nation. Uh, so why is Canada interested in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, thanks. Um, I'll maybe just challenge the question a little bit uh, because you left the part off at the end that we're also a Pacific nation. Uh, which is, I think, one of the primary reasons that we're interested in the Indo-Pacific. But I'll give you three other quick ones. Uh, first, uh, economics. Um, three of our top ten trading partners come from the Indo-Pacific. Um, and, of course, many of our other trading partners are in this part of the world. So it's important for us to be active and present um, as a result of that. Second, from a security standpoint, I would argue that effects in this region um, our global effects, which means that our security, our economics are affected by what happens here. And as a Pacific nation, we want to contribute to uh, maintaining stability and security in this part of the world um, going forward. And finally, I would suggest that some of our greatest partners and allies are in the Indo-Pacific, and we would like to be a strong partner and ally ourselves as we look at the world globally. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Excellent. Uh, for uh, Admiral Proctor, Dave, how might New Zealand and better uh, New Zealand and Australia better cooperate as Australia prosecutes a policy of continuous shipbuilding? And there's, there's a bunch of uh, defence industry people that will help you answer that question. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mike, and thanks for the question. Though I I think I'm going to be saying things that everyone probably knows. So. The opportunity space, I suppose, for, 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 for the Australian shipbuilding industry, because um, New Zealand does not really have a large shipbuilding industry. 
Um, we have built ships together in the past. The Anzac ships are an example, and indeed our protector um, vessels are an example of cooperation between New Zealand's industry and Australia's shipbuilding industry. I think it's the opportunity space. So we're a uh, reasonably small navy. So uh, nine ships, six classes. Um, the, the overhead and the burden as a parent navy for six classes of ship, because they are all unique, is very difficult for a small navy. So there's some opportunity there not just within the shipbuilding industry, but also in that through life support, uh, or through the through life support aspects of maintaining ships. The other part is all but one of our Navy's vessels necessarily will need to be replaced by the early to mid 2030s. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity space for shipbuilding. Uh, and if we look to leverage some of uh, how we've done things in the past, I think that is probably where. Um, the, the cooperation space uh, and opportunity exists. Thanks very much, Dave. Our next question is for uh, Admiral Sakai. Uh, noting the conflict which currently colours the modern world, uh, might you please remark upon the growing place of the Japan Maritime Self-Defence Force in the Indo-Pacific? Thank you for the wonderful and difficult question to answer. But <laughs> you know, uh, first thing I have to mention is you know what role the JMSDF is to play in achieving free and open in the Pacific. And this government policy and also JMSDF is deeply involved uh, to achieve that goals. From that point of view, uh, not only in the East China Sea and also uh, not only in South China Sea, you know, Japan's uh, ships and aircraft should be deployed beyond that area through uh, uh, Africa continent. You know, it's quite difficult and uh, very challenging. But to keep the safety and freedom of navigation of uh, those uh, sea traffic, you know, in the future, you know, JMSDF will have to deploy our ships and uh, to uh, Middle East and also Indian Ocean, and have you know, exercise or cooperation with uh, neighboring nations and you know, navies. And uh, those activities uh, would promote uh, our goal of free and open, open in the Pacific in the future. And we know uh, that poses a quite challenge on JMSC, but you know, it is uh, what should be done by JMSC and in cooperation with uh, allied and our uh, like minded you know, nations. Uh, thanks, Rio. That was the second hardest question for the panel. Uh, we've deliberately saved the hardest question to last, and we thought we'd direct it to the smartest man in the panel. So, Aaron, uh, noting that rules by themselves are insufficient, how is the Singapore Navy dealing with a contested maritime space and major power competition? Uh, please answer this in 30 words or less. <laughs> Mike, the clock says zero, zero, zero. I think we can end. Uh, we can respect everyone's time and end the question now. Uh, thank you for a very hard question. Um, I think, you, I mean, I said it in my speech. So rules themselves are insufficient. Uh, I think first, uh, we would like voluntary adherence. I think that's the best thing. So if people can, if, if countries can see that adherence to the rules are better than, uh, than not, I think that's the best case. Uh, and the, 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 the way to enable that is obviously constructive dialogue. Um, so uh, Singapore is a strong believer of that. And you see that in forums like Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, our International Maritime Security Conference, where uh, we sometimes have very fiery exchanges, but we think that is necessary and important for at least the views to get out and be formed. Um, I think the second one is to find areas of practical cooperation. I think some, some members have mentioned this. 
I think uh, my uh, Emerald Gupta talked about how we only cooperate when, when there's a convergence of interests. But I think when you look across countries, I think there generally is and are areas of interest that we can find. Uh, I remember someone, uh, a very interesting story, I will not mention names of countries here, spoke about how two countries generally disagreed about many, many things. But they were able to, they recognised that there was a specific issue that might flare up and they said, let's box that up into a box and let's talk about that with the goal of de-escalating it. I think we will have to adopt that model going forward. I'm going to add one final point, uh, which is that perhaps my answers are unsatisfactory uh, to some of you because you're, you're looking for you know, one, one point that will uh, illuminate how we can really, um, uh, really engender more broad-based adherence to the rules-based order. And I think that's very difficult now, and that's a function of the fact that the, the rules-based order and the, the global balance of power is shifting. Uh, but what is important then is as the, the, the plates under our feet start to shift, is that we be very nimble and agile to where it is going. Uh, I think uh, we have to lean into the partnerships that we have, uh, and we have to continue to find new ways of cooperation. And, and I, th I think ultimately the goal is then those of us who believe, uh, we seek to increase the numbers of us who believe and want to act for the rules-based order, and then for us to act in concert to minimise the space for those who would act otherwise. And I think that's, that's the best way forward. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Excellent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the questions and almost to the end of this session. Uh, we came here this afternoon to talk uh, about uh, the commonality of purpose in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and we got some great regional perspectives. The great takeaway for me was that we came to talk about commonality of purpose, but I leave with a very clear uh, understanding that what we've seen and heard this afternoon is not only commonality of purpose, but commonality of vision, and most importantly, commonality of commitment. And uh, I was struck uh, with Philip Poliwara's uh, very clear analogy uh, of the importance to sea power to people's security. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank me, join me in thanking uh, the esteemed panel uh, for this afternoon's great <laughs> presentations. Thank you very much. And the fact that you all stayed for over two and a half hours is very, very impressive. Uh, that brings this session to a close, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for your time and attention, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.